I will be talking about sanctuaries in the sky. Actually, I won't be talking about that. I will be talking about a comparison between religious and space architecture. And I want to give you some ideas why I think it could be a good idea to think this way. And at first, I would like to introduce a concept to you. Um, that is the concept of, or the, the, the idea of reification, which means that when you reify something, you convert an idea into a concrete thing. Right? You build something that was just an idea, or re you regard something that is just an idea as a concrete thing. And I will give you some examples from theology later on, but I will start with an example from Gestalt psychology. When you look at that, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight geometrical circles with geometrical with lines in them but what you also see is something that is not there in your mind you reify this cube right this geometrical structure so there is something that is not there and I think um, when we are talking about architecture we're talking about reification as well an architect when he builds a building reifies a concept he converts something into a concrete thing when you look at this room you're sitting there, you're listening to me, I'm talking to you. This room was designed, built for that single purpose. Well, probably not. You can move this thing and turn it into something else, right? But when you look at a church, there's a guy standing at the front. And when you look at older churches, there's actually something in between the lay people and the clerical people. So there was actually a divide. There's a divide between the holy and the secular building there. That is reification of a concept. And you regard something as a concrete thing that is not a concrete thing, and thereby you make it a concrete thing. There is also the notion, and that's what I just showed you, to perceive, sorry, <laughs> it's been a long couple of days, of reification as perception of a concrete thing in its absence, that was that example. But that is also an example that we will see in the later in the space architecture examples. So when you look at the history of theology, that is a church built in Roman architectural style. That represents a theological notion in, well, it wasn't really early Christianity, but it was at the beginning of the medieval times, the notion that there is a certain religious group that constructs a building that is directed toward the east and has very thick walls, small windows, gives shelter, gives protection, is something that is actually sort of a stronghold against outside forces. So this is reification of Christian theology against or protected from its, ad is it adversaries or adver adversaries? 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 I only read these words, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, you got to help me out there. I mean, I'm, I, I would be, you know, I'm German. If you make a mistake, I would be pretty happy to help you out too. <laughs> <laughs> this is the inside of a Roman church. And this is actually quite bright for a Roman church because this is not the one we've seen here. This has actually got the, the upper, the upper um, balcony, or not a balcony, but upper windows to let in more light. Because the problem with building such a fortress-like church is that you protect yourself from the outside, and literally from light, so it will be a very dark space. This is, as you can see, is a very quiet, uh, very, I want to say Klein, very small and cozy room, and it's oriented to the east, toward the altar and the crucifix, and it gives this, this feeling of an intimate community that is sheltered from the outside. Now, go on a couple, of year, a couple hundred years and you will find churches like these, Gothic architecture, that from the outside look very elaborate. I will show you a picture of Cologne Cathedral that is quite scary, not the cathedral, the picture. And uh, when you walk into a Gothic cathedral, it looks totally different from what you've just seen inside a Roman architecture church. This draws your eyes up to the heaven. This building represents a theology, reifies a theology that actually is no longer concerned with sheltering from the outside, finding a safe space within the community, but showing to the world that this religion, this religious institution, actually has a connection to the heavens. That's what this reifies. 
And um, nowadays, this is Cologne Cathedral. When you look, when you look at it from the spire, yeah, that's a crazy, that's a crazy Russian guy who has actually climbed the cathedral spire and taken that selfie <laughs> of his feet. But but look at it. Every church architecture also reifies another concept. It shows somebody looking up from above, probably God or a crazy Russian guy who climbs through the spire, <laughs> that there is a cross, a crucifix on the ground. It says, hey, Christianity is right here. So that is also place making, place taking. It reifies Christianity in a certain spot. This is another great example from Reformation times. Um, you see that the, there's the altar here. This is where you celebrate Holy Communion or the Eucharist. And the pulpit is right, but right over it. This is the Reformation notion that the Word of God, the spoken Word of God during the sermon is as important as the Eucharist. So they actually changed the architecture of churches to say, hey, we are Protestants, we are no longer Catholic. This is a change in architecture. They reify the notion of Protestantism. And just from there, we go to monasteries, which does not really make sense, but I need that for the rest of my paper. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went to Reformation, now we go back. Monasticism in medieval times. This is the ideal plan of a monastery. This is St. Gallen Monastery. In, is it Germany now? Is it Austria? I should have. I should have researched that. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> this is around 820, so probably Roman architecture. And when you look at it, it's all in German, right? So I can read it, you can, but I look very knowledgeable by telling you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cloister, the sequestered part. This is the church here. This is where the monks live. This is the garden. This is where they eat. This is the where they get rid of what they've eaten and drunk. And <laughs> this is actually the beer and wine cellar. So it is within the sequester of the cloistered part. That's very important. Um, this is where the new monks are being taught and come in. There's a hospital there. And all the rest around it is support architecture. There's a brewery there. There's gardens there. There's stables. And there's people working for the monastery that changed later on when cities become, became more prevalent. There were actually people doing these jobs in the city and the monastery didn't play such a huge role. But this monastery is basically sacred here and secular around it. But the secular part is the support structure and this is the actual structure that we're talking about. So there's a divide between those and there's a, v there's a communal, communal sleeping area a communal area for prayer or for the actual mission that's taking part. And then there's all the support structure around it. A couple of years later, a couple hundred years later, sorry, Carthusian, Carthusian monks built a new model of monasteries due to theological change. The monks no longer stay in communal quarters. They each have their own little house. This is the beginning of the modern day one family home from a Carthusian monastery. So the change is, it's still sequestered, you can see that here, from the support structure on the right, but now it's no longer a communal structure, it's individual quarters. But the mission that it revolves around now happens not only in the church, but also in their personal quarters. The monks meditate and pray to God within this personal space and not only come together for prayer in the church. So there's a divide between the mission. What happens in this sequestered part is no longer just happening in the church as it was before, but now it's also happening in the individual quarters. And I think this is quite interesting to look at when, you, when we think about space missions later on because these guys tried to cut them off from the world. They literally left the world to get a great, uh, uh, stronger connections to the heavens. Of course, they thought of heavens as something else that we do. But that is what astronauts and people who go to space will do. They will literally leave this world behind and try to find a way to live on their own for a specified 
time span, in the case of Mars 1 for the rest of their lives, but in other mission types for just uh, limited time spans. And we will need to find a way to support these people architecturally. So this is where I want to go, or this is the, the, the point I'm going to take. And I, I'm claiming that behind reification are two layers that we need to look at. And the one layer is pragmatic and the other is symbolic. You can do symbolic reification or you can do pragmatic reification. And I would think that the, for instance, the, the, the pulpit altar thingy, that is more of a symbolic thing, but the um, Roman church to Gothic <coughs> architecture change, that is actually also changing from a very pragmatic kind of architecture to a more symbolic architecture. Okay. First scenario for space exploration. We've heard that a couple of times, flags and footprints. We will probably all agree that planting a flag on the surface of the moon or on the surface of Mars, actually you should look that up, there's a great video, what would happen if NASA got more funding about guys planting flags with vigor on <laughs> celestial bodies, <laughs> really funny. Um, that is symbolic reification of something because the US does not own the moon be just because there's a couple of flags standing there. It just says we could do it and guess what Russians, you couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I think, this is not just symbolic. That sh on the one hand, it is symbolic and it shows, hey, this is a human bootprint. But on the other hand, it tells you that Buzz Aldrin, who weighed, I don't know how many pounds, together with his suit, <laughs> leaves. Sorry? He's 120 minutes last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, he may have added some weight through the surgery that he's had done. Um, if you look at that, that also, also clearly shows you how deep an astronaut of that weight with that area of footprint will sink into the lunar soil. So it solves the problem. It solves the problem of would a human astronaut actually be able to walk on the moon and how do we deal with future experiments? How much surface do we need to put a, an experiment of that and that weight on? So it, it was more than that, it was also pragmatic reification. A human is able to walk on the moon. And this, and I'm getting back to religion, this is um, Dave Scott on Apollo 15. This just, it's not a picture, nobody took a picture of that. Um, he left the Bible on the moon. That's symbolic, right? It's clearly symbolic. But this Bible is still there and it was bound in red leather and NASA actually went back to surveyor on Apollo 12 and cut off a couple of pieces of the hardware to check out how they fared in the lunar environment if you would go back there to get that Bible after when was it in 1971 oh 71 that was exactly 45 years ago the year I was born um, you would actually be able to learn a lot from that Bible because the, le the leather binding will probably be gone, but how far does radiation destroy a book of that size? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a weird mixture of a symbolic reification and a pragmatic reification as it could turn into an experiment. So we leave the moon here and go back to low Earth orbit. This is, I need your help again, cupola? Cupola. Cupola, thank you. Um, that was an architectural design feature, or is an architectural design feature of the International Space Station that should serve a single purpose, help the astronauts use the robotic arm more efficiently, have somebody be able to look out of that window or out of those windows and tell the other people where the arm is and steer and command the modules while building the International Space Station. But it solves a completely different purpose now. When you look at the, um, the where there's, there's data collected on what the astronauts do in their spare time when they don't do experiments. And guess what? Since that module is there, they all spend their time in that module. And you could say, okay, so now it's become a symbolic spot. It's become the symbolic reification of looking at home, the overview effect, taking a closer look at Earth. But it is also a very pragmatic reification, not the one they actually wanted, but the amount of pictures that have been taken of Earth has gone sky high. 
It's actually quite interesting. There's a report on the amount of digital pictures being taken on the ISS, and since cupola, cupola <laughs> is there, it basically goes off the scale. So something has changed. Now that they have this spot to look back on, they have a deeper connection to Earth, but not by just looking at it and thinking about it, but also by taking pictures and sending them back to Earth. So if any one of you dreams of building a space hotel, think zero G sex and a big window to watch the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably pay for the hotel. Don't think about the combination, okay? <laughs> <laughs> going, <laughs> going on to Mars, right? This is not what we want, we are going to have on Mars. I found that while, while looking at some, to find some pictures. This is not what we're <coughs> going to have. We don't want to, we are not going to have a single family home on the surface of Mars. The best we can hope for at the moment is something like this. It's a communal structure that is a pragmatic reification of a mixture of being there and doing something useful, right? That is just somebody having taken Mars Desert Research Station to the surface of Mars, or does it actually look like that? Natural That's the background? That's a picture of, yeah? yeah? Okay, good. I didn't know that, I just, I just found it and thought, okay, is that, is, that an, <laughs> is that an artist's conception, how it would look on Mars? Sorry? The sky is tinted red Yeah, okay, so it's, it's not an action. Somebody it's tinted the sky red to make it look like it was on Mars, but that's what it looks like, right? And if you look at the, the plans of that, that's quite fascinating. You have this, this structure that has a lower and an upper deck, and this is sort of the living qu quarters, but there's also computer workstations here. And you've got, you've got individual spaces like the Carthusian monastery had. So you would say, okay, this looks similar to that, right? You have a Car Carthusian monastery on Mars with a structure that actually is there for the, the stuff that transcends just living there. So science is, takes place where in the Carth Carthusian monastery the church was. I would think that's not the case because actually there is a huge communal thing too. So community plays a huge role in that because you just don't go there to be alone in your cell and contemplate Mars. You go there as a team and the team has specific roles which monks do not have, right? There's a, there's a commander of a mission, there's somebody who's responsible for experiments, somebody who's responsible for life support and so on. That was not the case in Carthusian monasteries. So we also, oh no, five minutes. I'm good, great, thank you. Um, we also, I'm, actually I'm, I'm already done, right? <laughs> Um, we also have a strong connection to Roman architecture. This is a, this is a building that's been built to withstand, to, to support humans in the light of outside, of an outside hostile environment. So this is Roman architecture at its best. Small windows, right? You can see the small windows. Um, I would say it's not a Carthu Carthusian, Carthusian. They're called Kartäuser in German, which is much easier to pronounce. <laughs> Carthusian monastery. Um, because of that communal aspect, I would say it's more akin to the ideal monastery. But the problem is, the sequestered part is there. Is there a wine cellar? On Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe there will be. I actually had a fascinating talk about booze on the ISS, but we can't go there yet. But the support structure, <laughs> the support structure is not there. And that is a problem. It is, has to be integrated into the research station or it has to come in periodically from the outside or you actually have to go back, otherwise you die. Um, now, I'm going far out, right? Human settlements in space. We're no longer talking about exploration. This is settlement. New York City <coughs> represents, reifies certain values. If you want to buy a condo in New York City, the higher up you go, the more expensive it gets because of the hue, right? And you're above the pollution and everything. So higher up is good. If we're thinking this, transferring the same value to an outer space environment, and I know that's just silly, but let's, let's go with it anyway. That would be really, really dumb, wouldn't it? 
going higher up in space, radiation, meteorites, no atmosphere, why would you want to pay for that? Actually, you would need to revert that and say, hey, the farther away I go from the surface, the safer I am. So maybe in a lunar city or in a Martian city, going down is more expensive. And that would be a <coughs> pragmatic re-evaluation of values. Or you could pragmatic, pragmatically re reify them through this. You would just take different spaces of your human settlement and give them certain tasks to specify. That is really something that I would deem pragmatically. But here comes the thing, we have that on Earth. I hope no, is, is anybody in the audience a prepper, part of the prepper movement? Uh -huh. yes. So, <laughs> my argument, you know, all know who the, what these guys do, right? They prepare for the end of the Earth. And um, my Thank argument you. would be, sorry? You can do that. Yeah, but in a different way. My, my, <laughs> my, my, my wife didn't allow me to install an air filter in our house. <laughs> so the thing is here, my argument here would be that, that at first glance it looks like this, right? Okay, but, but I think it's not. Actually, I think this is reifying a certain value set. Rugged individualism, being prepared, and so on and so forth. So this is, the, this is a... a standard family that lives on its own, prepared to live without the rest of society. So this is not taking something and giving it pragmatic values, this is actually symbolic value. This is the symbolic value of the single family. It's just like the, the rugged individual who conquered the wilderness. Um, there's actually a book out there, it's called Doomsday Bunkers of the Rich and Famous. Maybe you should look at that and <laughs> get more people into the movement. And talking about symbolic reification, I was quite interested I uh, to learn yesterday how this works when this guy for the Trump campaign spoke. And I'm just going to close with, this has moved me so much, I just need to do it. There's something else about symbolic <laughs> reification. <laughs> <laughs> the talk about the wall. Yeah. I don't think we're talking about a wall here. I think we're talking about reifying that some uh, uh, something that is there. A good German word that is Angst, mm -hmm. and it reifies in a wall that the Mexicans are going to pay for. And this is a, a prime example for architecture that does not actually solve a purpose, but just brings a point across. And so the point I'm trying to make with showing this, there's actually a point behind this, <laughs> is that when we think about space architecture and we say, okay, it's not about flags and footprints, I just think it should be in part about flags and footprints, but it should also be clever enough to see that sometimes when we think we need to reify something, we just don't, and we should leave it be and just reify the pragmatic things. And with that, I stop and say thank you for listening. <laughs> we, need, we need to get this off the... Uh, do we have five minutes for questions? Okay, we'll leave that on then. <laughs> <laughs> you said earlier that the, the cupola formed a certain human need on the space station that wasn't, it wasn't originally... I take Trump off, okay? <laughs> okay, we'll go back to the cupola. Then. That, that, I mean, don't, do you think that that's, I mean, from Mars habitat, mm -hmm. and I, we looked at the HAB module, so it would seem to me that it would be a psychological, and Reverend Heiser would probably add, and I would second, a, a spiritual need for, I would assume, most of the astronauts to have some place to meditate, or contemplate, or pray, or yeah. what have you. How would that fit into an architecture on Mars? Well, the thing is, you couldn't have cupola, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. so I, I'm tended to say cupola, cupola. Mm -hmm. Because, well, you could have that but you would look at the surface of Mars, right? So this was used by the astronauts to have a connection to Earth, to the planet Earth, and that seems to be, for them, seems to give them a spiritual connection, for some even a religious connection. If you're on the surface of Mars, Earth will just be a tiny speck of light uh, over the horizon. 
and uh, maybe that gives you a perspective, but then your meditation or your prayer or your spirituality would either turn toward the transcendence or probably inward, not to the rest of humanity. So if we were to think the, the way you suggest, and I would agree with you, some of the astronauts would want something like that. The question is, need it be communal? Or could it be part of these, um, these, um, these individual spaces, right? We could also have that. I mean, if we have a diverse crew, it would probably be better to have it individually. Um, but if we have a, maybe this serves as a spiritual place. Maybe this is the, 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 way, the kind of spirituality that develops when you are the only group of humans on a planet that is only, well, that is. Best group of Darren Bath and the the planet. Well, actually, this is the only planet where only robots live at the t this time, right? <laughs> so <it's laughs> you would be the only human population on that. And maybe that is where our spirituality will go. But I, I do agree. I don't think we can plan it because um, we would need a pretty homogenous group if we wanted to plan it. Right? But there should be some si something. So there was a question there. You wanted to ask a question, is that right? Ma'am, did you no. want to? No? OK. So I thought that. So Martin, go ahead. Right. So, um, have you thought about this in terms of what would be the impact on the Earth? In the so, what's your reality? Some people are talking about like, what's your reality? And it's becoming a bit more visible. And in 10 years' time, perhaps people are, when you need to experience something more than this, what you have, you can go into this question about that. Have you thought about that? So, you mean. Um, um, enhancing the human habitat on the surface of Mars virtually by having a virtual experience that gives you more than that. I was, I was at a workshop in January about building a lunar city and there was a lady who was representing Rose Cosmos and they have plans for a lunar habitat that actually incorporates a pond and some trees and a beach. And they think that would be something that humans would want on the moon, and they would also enhance it by virtual reality, right? Going back to Earth. I think that's a good idea for the first step, but on the other hand, if you want to settle that planet, how well can you settle when you're always looking back, right? So what, what, would, you, what the, would the virtual environment be like? Would you look at different parts of Mars? Yeah, yeah, I mean, because that is just not, that is what people do not think about, right? I'm going to live on Mars. No, you're going to live in a tin can. And if you want to go outside, you have to put on that huge suit. You have to be prepared for that, right? And virtuality could make that easier, yeah. The, sp the planet that's populated by robots, the robots could actually help you explore that planet virtually. But then there's the question, why go at all, right? So I have a friend here. Together when he was done with that, and he talked about I'm not sure if it was the cupola, but something that looked out in the darkness of space. And it's, you've never imagined the black that that is. And I just think that you know the black can't handle mm -hmm. it. And, um, well, that but I that's a, by it. I don't know. Yeah, who he was. but but the thing is the way you're telling it. Yes, I, I'm. I don't know if I'm moved by it, but I, I'm. I, I was always wondering, why do they keep looking down at Earth? I mean, that's what they just left, right? And you just, you're, you're looking back at it. Why don't you look on the other side? Isn't that like vacation pictures, though? Yeah. But when I go on vacation to Bavaria, I don't bring pictures of my house. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you.